I'm delighted to welcome you all um, and our faculty. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome Professor Elenti Gruja, who is our speaker tonight. Professor Elenti Gruja is professor at the law school of the University of Exxon at Marseille and director of the Master II program in public international law. She's global Houser professor at NYU and a member of the UN Human Rights Committee. She has written extensively in international law and among her many publications, her more, uh, most recent one is the commentary of the American Convention on Human Rights, which she co-edited with Professor Hannibal and has been published by Oxford University Press this year. And this is a very important publication and she will introduce this um, publication also uh, to us tonight. Um, I also want to point out that this would make a fantastic Christmas present. <laughs> so I'm going to make that to present the book. Um, so, <laughs> Professor Tiguja's uh, lecture tonight is entitled The Inter American Human Rights System as a Laboratory of the New Use Gentium. Well, question mark. Um, the legacy of Judge Antonio Cansado Lindaza. And she will analyze the social, legal, and political past and current project of the Inter-American Inter uh, Court of Human Rights. For those that are familiar with the uh, Inter-American uh, Court, its jurisprudence has developed the pro persona uh, principle for the interpretation of the American Convention on Human Rights. And in this respect, it has been profoundly influenced by the theory of new use gentium that was developed by the late um, Judge Antonio Cansado Lindade, who sadly passed away uh, in May 2022. Now, this ILA lecture is also a tribute to the extraordinary legacy of a visionary jurist, Judge Antonio Cansado Lindade, who was initially judge uh, and president of the Inter American Court of Human Rights and later judge of the International Court of Justice. His theory places individuals in the center of, international, of the international legal order, and his objective was to humanize international law. And this objective and reasoning run through his teaching, his uh, many publications, and his work as a jurist, as a judge at the American court, and later at the ICJ, including in his opinions, uh, which distinguished themselves for their rigor, uh, human focus, and personal accounts. Now, allow me to share briefly with you, and before I give the floor to our distinguished speaker, that I first met uh, Judge Antonio Cansado de Rade at the Hague Academy of International Law in 2005, uh, where he gave his general course. And as his student at the Academy, his course, um, International Law for Humankind Towards a New Use Gentium, it was entitled, was a very inspiring experience. Now, allow me to read just one extract from his lecture, which I think is typical of his personal inspiring style. And I quote, this is the task ahead for the new generations of international law scholars like the ones gathered here in this summer of 2005 at the Hague Academy of International Law. It has been in moments of deep crisis as the one we experience today that qualitative advances have been achieved the horrors of World War II did not impede the emergence and growth of international human rights law. The horrors of contemporary genocides have not hindered the advances of international criminal law. Despite the recurrence of atrocities in the last decades, human, human conscience has reacted in fostering the current process of humanization of international law basic considerations of humanity nowadays permeating the whole of its corpus juris constitute yet further indications of the path to follow. And I think this is a message of hope and humanization for our discipline. And with this, I give the floor to our distinguished guest, Professor Elenti Gruji, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for organizing this um, this lecture and uh, giving me the opportunity first to come and to meet uh, with uh, with you and with the audience and more importantly, as you say, to maybe share um, based on this uh, publication, but share some reflections and some questions I have. Uh, we, we have spent uh, three years working on this book, but now I have more questions than uh, answers after uh, the publication of the, of the book. And uh, so I would like to 
explain uh, why, to, to me, uh, we should really consider the, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court uh, and the, the Inter-American uh, Commission of, of, of Human Rights. What is it important, not only for um, Inter-American lawyers, not only for human rights lawyers, but also for public international lawyers and maybe also private international <laughs> lawyers. Um, uh, so, so I'm going to try to uh, without quoting a lot of jurisprudence, so I, I, I'm going to try not to be too technical, but I, I, I would like really to, to share some, some reflections and also some, some pending questions. But maybe before, and we are in a closed meeting and yet there are some people online, but maybe before sharing with you a sort of frustration I have when I talk about the, uh, the inter-American system and then when I present the inter-American system to non-inter-American lawyers, uh, in general, um, I have a lot of, I, I receive a lot of uh, skepticism, uh, especially from uh, European lawyers, I have to say, uh, and, and I receive three kind of arguments and, and uh, really that upset me in general. Uh, in general, some uh, scholars uh, use the sophistication argument, no need to read the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Commission or Inter-American Court, because it's not as sophisticated as the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. The other argument I um, always receive is the exotic argument. Oh, this court, uh, this Inter-American Court in San Jose, Costa Rica is so exotic. There are many decisions with use cogens, with uh, aggravated responsibility with uh, uh, so exotic solution, it's not serious. So we, we do not need to consider this, uh, this jurisprudence. And the third argument in the, or sort of pushback I in general receive is a non-implementation argument. No need to read the jurisprudence because states do not respect the decisions of the inter-American. Um, for, for me, it's not very honest and intellectually speaking, it's not the kind of argument that is acceptable or, yeah, it could be acceptable, but before, uh, be, but after a, a thorough analysis of the jurisprudence, I, and I would agree with uh, this kind of uh, pushback and comments, but only uh, with, when, when it's uh, done based on a thorough analysis of, uh, of the jurisprudence. So, that's also why we, we decided to write this book, uh, to, to try also to, to, to explain uh, that it's not true to say, for instance, that the, the jurisprudence is not sophisticated or the reasoning is not uh, thorough and is not grounded. And uh, so we, we hope, I, 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 let's see, but uh, we hope we, we at least uh, achieve this um, demonstration that the system deserves to, um, uh, to be considered and to be taken seriously by scholars, by researchers, and by public international lawyers. So I say also this because in the room there are some students, there are some PhD candidates, and uh, in general my PhD students, when, I, uh, when they work on a human rights topic and I say, oh, maybe you should also have a look to the jurisprudence of the African organs and the inter-American organs. Yeah, I receive also this kind of uh, non-sophistication uh, uh, argument, which is, uh, of course, uh, the kind of explanation I, I strongly um, disagree. Um, so after this uh, preliminary remark, I would like maybe to share based on what uh, what then I said, I would like to share some uh, reflection on two or three um, questions or, or topics in relation with uh, the inter-American system and especially the jurisprudence of the uh, inter-American Court of uh, Human Rights. And as I said, why for me, it's uh, really this illustration of the humanization of uh, public international law with a lot of criticisms uh, we, could, uh, we could have with a lot of, uh, um, important questions that may raise, but uh, yeah, it's a, um, a, an example or laboratory of uh, uh, humanization of uh, jurisprudence. So maybe first, I do not know how familiar you are with the system, but maybe first I would like to give more illustration of what we could um, call the identity uh, of uh, the inter-American system, what are the main features of this system, especially compared to the European system or the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee I am uh, familiar with. And we have also uh, uh, in the audience, uh, one of the uh, former members of the, of the Human Rights Committee. Um, so the identity uh, of the inter-American system and based on the jurisprudence of um, uh, the commission and the courts, 
reveals um, from the very beginning, from the very first uh, advisory opinions and judgment of the um, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, so in early uh, 80s, uh, a quite consistent, even evolving, but quite consistent uh, uh, approach to the object and purpose of uh, the American Convention on Human Rights adopted in 1969. And it's important because we do not have necessarily this consistency in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. But here we have this consistent approach, consistent interpretation of the object and purpose of the, of the um, American Convention on Human Rights. And it's very basic. Uh, the object of and purpose of the American Convention is to protect human rights. And that's why then you have all these developments on the pro-persona, pro-homine uh, pro philosophy uh, that leads uh, the jurisprudence and the, and the interpretation of the Inter-American uh, Court of, uh, of Human Rights. And when we talk about pro-persona, pro-homine approach, it's not just a theoretical uh, point. It's not just, uh, you know, in the, for instance, in the, in the course of uh, uh, Judge Cansado Trindade at the Egg Academy, but it's really uh, this pro-persona or pro-homine um, uh, element uh, was really or is really translated in in each I would say aspect of um, the, the the mechanism or the functioning of the uh, inter-American system conditions of admissibility procedural questions I don't know about interim measures provisional measures uh, scope of jurisdiction of the organ everything is really interpreted on the basis or having in mind this pro-persona and pro homine uh, approach and, uh, and uh, object and purpose of the um, American Convention on, uh, on Human Rights. So it's really really the identity of, uh, of the court, uh, of the jurisprudence of the court uh, uh, and the normative project of the, uh, of the court and also the, the, the commission. And of course it was, or it is, fed by, uh, in the history of the organs, by different um, inputs or different legacies by, by different chairs of the, uh, of, the, of the court. So I'm going to take three examples of uh, uh, input and influence of, of chairs. So I'm starting, of course, by uh, uh, Judge uh, Antonio Cancelo Trindade, uh, which was, uh, as uh, Dana said, which was really um, uh, in favor of the promotion of the individuals um, as a subject of the system. So not only as a, a, an object of the system, not only, you know, put in this passive uh, position of someone to be protected, but uh, he really, in its uh, judgments, uh, dissenting opinion, uh, concurring opinion, he really uh, put forward this idea that the petitioners, the victims, uh, should also be part of the proceeding. So not only, again, not only um, a passive uh, individuals to be protected by uh, the commission or to be protected by the state, but the party, the petitioners and, and their family and the victims should be granted a procedural place in uh, in the, the proceedings before the Inter-American Court, uh, which, which is important because on the contrary uh, to the European system, uh, individuals do not have the statutes of parties before the, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So it, it was really something brought in the proceedings by Judge Cancedo based on this approach, based on this humanization of international law and the idea that if we have a tribunal, this tribunal cannot be just a face-to-face -face between the commission and the state. And this tribunal should be focused and should be, should reserve a space and, 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 and a place uh, to uh, the victims, to the first person interested by uh, the proceeding. Uh, another element in its uh, in his uh, legacy as, as chair of the of the Inter-American Court was um, maybe something I'm more I'm less, I would say, convinced. Uh, but it's uh, uh, his promotion of what Prosper Veil, a famous uh, public inter French public international lawyer, would call uh, supernormativity. So it's true that 
uh, when when Judge Kansado was sharing uh, the uh, Inter-American Court, there were in, in many judgments of the of the Inter-American Court this uh, utilization, this use of use against and access to justice as a norm of use against prohibition of discrimination as a norm of use against um, obligation to investigate as a norm of use against. Um, yeah, maybe it's uh, it's not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we can discuss. I'm not. It, that's not the part of uh, of uh, his approach to international law. I'm the most uh, uh, convinced. But it's true that the idea of uh, using um, this supernormativity, using use against, was also a way to highlight uh, the, the, the 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 significance of, of the violations committed by the state. So uh, Antonio Cansado Trindade was also in favor, for instance of using um, uh, the, the state crime element uh, taken from the work of the International Law Commission. So it was really in some cases, versus Paraguay, for instance, of cases of enforced disappearances, of grave and massive violations of human rights. It was really in favor of introducing in public international law this concept of uh, state crime. So when a state does commit uh, such uh, grave violations as uh, enforced disappearances, uh, his position was to say that we, we have to use this criminal vocabulary in order to capture uh, the gravity of the behavior of, um, of, uh, of the state, uh, also aggravated responsibility and, and so on. But we do not have in the more, more, more recent judgment of the, of the Inter-American Court, we have much less use of use again. So it, it's really one part of his legacy, but I'm not sure that uh, it's still used or uh, the, 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 the other judges of the Inter-American Court are still convinced by uh, this uh, super normativity um, that he, he really promoted. Another element of his legacy that for me is really fascinating, much more fascinating than the super normativity, <laughs> is uh, what, what I would call the universal or universalist hermeneutics. So it's really something that came um, in, in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, this idea that when the court does interpret uh, the American Convention on Human Rights, um, the court used uh, actually a, a sort of international corpus juris. So if there is a question or if the case is about children's rights, uh, what the court is going to do is that the, the court is going to use all kinds of norms, binding norms, non-binding norms, uh, inter-American norms, European, African, um, international, domestic, in order to, to try to, to, inter to, to provide the maximal interpretation, that's also the vocabulary used by uh, the, the court, the maximal interpretation of the American Convention. So in order to develop the potential of the, of the terms used by the, the, the drafters of the, uh, of the American Convention, uh, the, the court uh, used these international corpus juris. Of course, states, <laughs> States strongly disagree with this way of interpreting because it's absolutely not respectful of state consent. But of course, in his uh, 2005 course, uh, Cansado uh, Trinidad explained uh, his position on state, on, uh, state consent. I will go back to this element because it's one of the main uh, reasons of the, of the current pushback against uh, the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court, this use of corpus juris, this use of different norms in order to interpret the uh, 1969 uh, uh, convention. And on the substance, and that's really also, one, for me, one of the most important elements in his um, approach to, uh, to human rights, on the substance, his uh, legacy is really has really to do with access to justice. Uh, is he, he really struggled in many cases, very famous cases on uh, again and for his appearances, and for his appearances, statutes of limitation, uh, impunity. He really uh, struggled in favor of uh, offering access to justice for victims, for family of victims, uh, for, for family of, of the victims, but also for, for, for the society. So it's really what this fight against impunity element is really one of uh, his uh, most important uh, legacy. And um, 
access to justice, not only uh, at the domestic level, but also at the international level. And this framed, again, for those of you who are interested in litigation, for instance, this really frames, uh, framed uh, his interpretation of uh, uh, condition of admissibility, uh, interim measures, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so um, his legacy is not only uh, on the substance, but but again, it's it's really a, a sort of institutional legacy or also procedural um, uh, legacy. And and based on this, uh, I would mention two um, other um, very important chairs that that who I would say have developed the different elements, but but maybe in in different ways. Uh, another important share um, uh, of the Inter-American court uh, is or was um, uh, the Mexican uh, judge, uh, McGregor Prazo, and uh, it, it was very important because he, he took this idea of, um, of uh, access to justice, but uh, in, a, in a broader sense, so not only access to justice in cases of uh, a grave and massive violation of human rights as torture uh, and false disappearances and so on, but access to economic justice. So he really developed also, um, and this triggers a lot of criticisms, but he, he really developed also um, the, 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 the recognition of economic, social and cultural rights in the scope of the American Convention on Human Rights. Normally, the American Convention on Human Rights is, I would say, a, a cl quite classical treaty focused on civil and political rights. But there is a provision, very broad provision, Article 26 of the, con of the Convention. I mean, it, it's really a a soft law provision or a vague provision. It does not say it does not say much on economic, social, and cultural rights. But using this hermeneutics and uh, this um, normative project to 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 develop the access to economic justice, this provision was really used and is currently used as the legal basis of the development and recognition of economic, social, and cultural rights in the scope. Uh, of the um, of, of protection of the American uh, Convention on Human Rights, and it's interesting. We may criticize the technique. We may criticize the use of this very weak and very broad uh, uh, provision. But the reasoning of, uh, uh, of of the judge is interesting because uh, his point is really also to to explain that when we talk about enjoyment and exercise of human rights, we are not talking, you know, in a very abstract manner, but we are talking about people that uh, are really uh, situated, that are that have some features that maybe in general uh, live in situation of poverty and economic inequality in Latin America, where. Um, the American Convention uh, does apply is, is one of the major problems. So it, it's interesting because it's complementary to uh, what Cancelo Trinidad did. It's not only about fighting against impunity and fighting for justice and, and for accountability, but it's also working on the, con on, on the condition, on the social and economic condition of enjoyment and exercise of human rights. If you live in a situation of extreme poverty, you cannot uh, use properly your freedom of expression or your access to just to tribunals and so on. So his, his, his legacy and, and his point is really also to, to, to make much more visible um, with this economic, social, and cultural rights aspect, but to make much more visible uh, the, the structure in the society, and especially the economic structure in the society that, that may be obstacles to the exercise and enjoyment of, um, of, of human rights. And it's really something, for instance, that I do not see a lot in the jurisprudence of other um, other bodies, and there, there is, for instance, a famous judgment, a very interesting judgment versus Brazil on slavery, and it, for me, it was one of, it's it, on the, the recent judgment of the American court, it's one of the best judgment, because it really captures, it, it's um, on the so-called modern slavery, slavery, and it really captured the economic, uh, historic, structural discrimination against uh, 
people living in the north of Brazil and how actually this situation of slavery was made possible because of the structure of domination in the, in, in, in the society. So it's really something uh, extre extremely uh, interesting, the, this work on the structure of, of, um, of the society and how the structure of the society can make a situation of violation of human rights possible, actually. And again, I do not see this a lot in, in jurisprudence of um, other uh, treaty bodies. The, 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 the final, um, and then I move to my other point, but the final example of, of uh, the final chair I, I wanted to also mention is more recently uh, Elizabeth Benito Odio. Uh, she was, uh, she's from Costa Rica and she, she chaired also uh, until very recently. Uh, the the, 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 the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and she also elaborated on, I would say, a similar aspect, structure of discrimination, uh, pattern of discrimination, uh, but more um, uh, focusing on some groups and very vulnerable groups and how these groups are made vulnerable based on history, again, based on their uh, ethnicity, based on their gender, based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, and so on and so forth. So we, there are many judgments, um, quite recent judgments of the um, of the Inter-American Court, again, working on this pattern of discrimination, structural discrimination, intersective discrimination, even I would say in quite traditional cases of extrajudicial killing, uh, I mean, it, it's not a new topic in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, but now when there is a case of extrajudicial killing, there's also a sort of analysis of the invisible part of the extrajudicial killing. Why this victim? Why this victim belonging to an ethnic uh, group, for instance, or an indigenous community, or uh, a situation, a living in situation of poverty? So now there's, of course, the statement that an extrajudicial killing is a violation of the right to life, but also uh, trying to, uh, this attempt to analyze uh, why this violence was made possible against uh, this person or, or, or that group of, uh, uh, of person. And uh, uh, for me, when I compare uh, the jurisprudence and, and when I, uh, you know, read uh, uh, all these inputs and the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court and, and the way the Inter-American Court analyzes uh, this aspect of discrimination compared to other uh, human rights bodies, even bodies focusing on discrimination like CEDAW, the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the third uh, Committee on uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I have the impression that uh, the Inter-American Court is the place where uh, this element of discrimination is the best uh, captured. Um, very brief briefly for um, uh, my, okay. Uh, two uh, other now that's the DNA. So for, for me, this pro when, when we when we talk about the pro persona pro omine interpretation of the treaty, it it it, it has a meaning. It has a substance. Uh, it really means something in the way. Uh, in the history of the court, uh, the judges have interpreted the rights, have interpreted the state's obligation. Uh, now my second question or the second question I would like to uh, maybe to ask is uh, about the exportation of, uh, of this way of interpreting uh, the American Convention on Human Rights. Um, there are many books, there are many papers, there are many discourses on uh, the ECHR as a model. The ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, that should be followed, that is followed, that is a leader, that is the best system on human rights. But we do not have actually a lot of books on um, either the American system or the uh, Inter-American Court as being a model or the African uh, Commission or Court as being, a, uh, as being a model. Of course, we have to a certain extent, a sort of cross-fertilization. So I cannot say that uh, the jurisprudence of the inter-American uh, organs is totally ignored by the other, by other um, uh, human rights bodies, for instance, um, 
there is an increasing use of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court by the African uh, Commission and African Court, especially when dealing with uh, indigenous communities' rights, it's true, or freedom of expression. Uh, there is also an increasing use of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court by the Human Rights Committee, um, especially in cases on environment and human rights or cases on indigenous communities' rights. Uh, more recently, the Human Rights Committee did adopt a, a decision on detention of, of uh, detention of a child um, in situation of migration, and uh, the committee did refer to the advisory opinion of um, of the Inter-American Court on. Um, children in migration. Um, but, and for the European court, it's the same. You, you may find in the jurisprudence uh, references to um, uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American court and enforces appearances or military tribunals. So it happened. But um, it's it's not, again, we, we do not have this, uh, and I would love to, to, to read this position or this uh, affirmation of the uh, Inter-American Court that could be used as a model uh, to be followed or to be, to, to be exported. And for me, the interest of having this sort of model or, or this assumption that if that the, the, the Inter-American Court discourse of the Inter-American Court uh, uh, interpretation of rights could be uh, followed or could be used as a model. It's really what I said about vulnerabilities and um, the, the approach to discrimination. Again, and, and, and for me, it's much more than a technical aspect when we talk about discrimination or when we talk about uh, vulnerabilities. It's really a philosophy of human rights. And it's really, as, as you said, it's really how you place the individuals and how you place the individuals in the society. And uh, that's, for me, that is what I, I do not see anymore in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. So that's also why I say that maybe we should, uh, especially for European lawyers, we should start to read other way of thinking the relationship between the individuals and, and the state, be, between the individuals and the communities and, 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 and so on. So uh, there are many, again, there are many criticisms, there are many uh, yeah, criticisms we could have on the jurisprudence, on the on, on the interpretation uh, of the Inter-American Court. So I'm not saying, of course, that everything is perfect and that it's the best uh, jurisprudence in, in the world. Yeah, again, I, I just want, I do not want to be uh, misunderstood, but in terms of project, in terms of philosophy, in terms of approaching uh, many very important issues. I think we have a lot to learn um, uh, from the, uh, the Inter-American um, system. Now, the problem is, and uh, that's my third uh, point, uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, th th there are a lot of uh, pushbacks, criticisms, uh, especially from state parties. Uh, very recently, uh, a couple of states in 2019 uh, published, uh, and it was led by Chile, uh, but Brazil, agree, Paraguay, and the, the idea of these states, so they published a declaration. And in, the, the declaration was interesting, interesting because in this declaration, the states call for um, uh, more, um, uh, formalist uh, interpretation of the American Convention on Human Rights. And uh, more precisely, they really call for uh, using subsidiarity and margin of appreciation. So more European models. So they really say to the inter-American system, especially the commission and the court, that uh, uh, these organs should be more careful, especially when they use this international corpus juris I mentioned. Because, of course, as I said, uh, it's absolutely not respectful of the state consent. So the state were, uh, were uh, not happy um, with uh, this way of, uh, of doing uh, and, and this way of interpreting. So my, my question, but I do not have actually um, a, a, an answer, but my question is, uh, should or could the, the the, the organs be more less innovative or more more um, self-restrained, more modest, more 
uh, respectful of the state consent, um, more respectful of, also of uh, this uh, subsidiarity element, this margin of appreciation. It's true, and, and uh, then I re re recall this, it's true that the state consent is not the paradigm used by the by the inter-American court. But in the meantime, uh, the, the court is an international body and uh, its function is to interpret an international treaty. So it's really difficult to to uh, to do without the states, uh, because if you do without the states, at the end of the process, of course, the state may decide to withdraw, uh, and that was the position of uh, uh, of Venezuela in uh, in two thousand and um, in two thousand and twelve. But it's it's so I, I do not have an answer to this question. You know, should this the, the court be more cautious or be more prudent or be more kind with the states? I do I, I do not know because. The, the project of the Inter-American Court, um, in addition of this pro-persona uh, element, is really to be transformative, and uh, is the vocabulary used by the by the court itself. Uh, transformative. It means that when the court does deliver a judgment, and especially it's uh, in relation to the reparation aspect, uh, the purpose of the reparation is to transform. To transform something, to transform the life of the victim, the life, of, and if the victim disappeared, to transform the life of the family, to transform also the society. So that's why in the judgments of the Europe of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, you have these very, very long paragraphs on pecuniary measures, non-pecuniary measures that must be adopted by the states. And the idea is not just to compensate, but the idea is really to transform uh, the society, because, as I said, one of the main aspects that is visible in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court is that, in general, it has to do with structure. So the ambition of the Inter-American Court is not only to address an individual case, but the ambition of the court is to address a structure, and the structure that made possible a situation an enforced disappearance, an act of torture, gender violence, domestic violence, and so on and so forth. So it's extremely ambitious. And these trigger criticism. Maybe it's over ambitious, it's um, irrealistic, it's arrogant, uh, it's authoritarian. So I'm, I'm using some words I, I have also read in, in scholarship. Uh, anti-democratic, because in, indeed sometimes the Inter-American Court does impose in its advisory opinion or judgment some uh, social choice, you know, so some, some scholars say, and, and, and I take the point, that it's really not uh, the, the role or the place of the Inter-American Court to impose uh, such or such um, uh, top, top position or topic. Uh, so, this transformative uh, mandate or this transformative ambition of the of the inter-American court, um, of course, is not compatible with the state consent, and it's and it it's it's not really compatible with the subsidiarity element. Uh, so it's difficult to I mean if it's difficult to say that the, the inter-American court should be more cautious or should uh, have more. Uh, space or reserve, reserve more space for subsidiarity or margin of appreciation because it would need, it, it would require from the Inter American Court to totally reshape his, his mandate and, and his amb its ambition. And, uh, and this transformative element, it's in the DNA of, of, the, of the Inter American system, of the, of the Inter American um, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, and and I have the impression, actually, that um, the, the Inter-American Court is much more similar to the EU Court of Justice, you know, with this very normative and very pres prescriptive approach to uh, its relationship with uh, domestic systems, with uh, societies uh, of the state parties to the, uh, to the um, uh, to the American Commission on Human Rights. So I do not know, I mean, I do not know, uh, and, and, and we, we already had this discussion in another forum, uh, 
uh, and uh, we have actually for the Human Rights Committee the same question of the same problem, should a human rights body or an education body be uh, more respectful of state consent or be more respectful of subsidiarity, margin of appreciation in order to, to try to keep the state in the system or should the entire American court, you know, keep following its nature, its DNA, and 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 you know have this uh, uh, transformative uh, uh, ambition. I have to say, yeah, I, uh, we can we can discuss. I, I would be very interested also to to hear um, uh, to to hear the the, the audience. Final point: um, uh, What's the future of this uh, inter American system? So, I, as I said, for. And as for many uh, human rights organs, there are many, many pushbacks and, and questions. But in terms of substance, um, the, the inter-American system is facing the same kind of challenges as other human rights bodies. All challenges are new challenges. So all challenges, it's, it means that uh, the inter-American system is still facing the same kind of challenges that uh, uh, already exist at the beginning of the system. Uh, threats on democracy, uh, pushback on the uh, civic space, and uh, um, uh, lack of uh, independence of the judiciary, and so on. So very classical, I would say, uh, uh, questions of discrimination, implementation of uh, international decisions. On, on, on the new challenges, it's true that we have also in the jurisprudence a new element, new topics that are emerging like environment, like private actors. And the, so, so very recently, the court adopted an interesting judgment on business and human rights. Um, also, the, the, the court has to do, the court and the commission have to do with the, the post COVID-19 uh, societies mm -hmm. also and the, the, uh, the dramatic consequences it had in terms of uh, inequality, economic inequality, but not only economic inequality. Um, pessimistic or optimistic for this future of the inter-American system, it, again, I do not have an answer, but I do not have an answer because for, as for any other uh, human rights body, it's a daily struggle actually so it's difficult to say oh it's lost or uh, yeah i mean we can take for granted that this question is solved it's really a, a, a daily struggle uh, and and what i like in this inter-american system is that the inter-american court and the inter-american uh, commission are really struggling bodies uh so that's what uh renders me i would say optimistic for the future of the system and I, thank you very very much for this um quite a revealing, I think, um, uh, lecture. Can I point out, it's uh, fascinating to, to also al always learn about the vision that is behind, um, the vision of the author that is behind a particular project. And it seems that um, there is a vision that you and, um, and uh, Professor Hennebel have had with this particular uh, work. Um, perhaps I'm attaching a different vision to what you have in mind, but my understanding is that you want to reveal that this exists and that this can have a significant impact beyond the confines of um, the American continent. So I think that is an important uh, vision indeed and fascinating to learn more about it now and understand this book in a different light. In fact. Um, and also you raised the question about, I think um, to some extent, you reveal that the interpretation of any uh, treaty, especially human rights treaties, is not a political. A lot of politics within the process of interpretation are ha happening within the, um, the, the room of uh, where the judges are um, first, um, discussing, but of course the politics surrounding the particular interpretive pronouncements. And join me, please, in thanking Professor. <laughs>